The Quiz Kids, presented by the makers of Alka-Seltzer. We're on the air with the School Kids Questionnaire. The Quiz Kids, five bright-eyed youngsters ready to start another difficult examination. Questions for the examination were selected by Sidney L. James of the editorial staffs of Time and Life magazines from among those you listeners sent in. The sender of each question used will receive a fine new Zenith portable radio within the next day or two. Each of the five children on tonight's program will be awarded a $100 denomination United States savings bond by the makers of Alka-Seltzer for his efforts tonight. And the three with the highest scores will be invited back next week. And now, the chief quizzer himself, Joe Kelly. Thank you, Marvin Miller, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The quiz kids and myself hope your Christmas has been most pleasurable. Our guest observer tonight is Miss Charlotte Carr, director of Hull House, Chicago's world-famous settlement. And tonight's quiz kids are Van... I'm Van Dyke Terry. I'm 13, and I'm in the third year of Thornton Township High School. Joan? I'm Joan Bishop. I'm 14 years old, and I go to the Chicago School for Adults. Gerard? I'm Gerard Darrell. I'm eight years old, and I go to the Bradwell School. Lois? I'm Lois Carp. I'm 15 years old, and I'm a sophomore at Lakeview High School. And Claude? I'm Claude Brenner. I'm 12 years old, and I go to Sen High School. And by the way, friends, Claude was born in South Africa and lived there until just a year or two ago. And by the way, Claude, how did you like your Christmas here as compared with Christmas in Africa? Well, I thought it was wonderful, but uh, it compares very well with ours at home. Well, fine. <laughs> well, say, let's get along here and say, before we really get started, you know, last night, speaking of Christmas, uh, jo- uh, Joe Jr. and myself were trimming the Christmas tree, and he threw a quiz at me that I really couldn't get. And I just would like to prove uh, to him that uh, the quiz kids can't get it either. So I'm going to give you a chance. Now, Santa Claus has eight reindeer, and if they are hitched up to his sleigh in a straight line, one right behind the other, how many of them could say, I see at least four sets of antlers ahead of me? Now, remember, uh, kids, the reindeer are in a straight line, one right behind the other. How many could say, I see at least four sets of antlers ahead of me? Van? Well, none of them, because we can't talk. Oh! (laughs) That's right. Is my face red? <laughs> All right, now let's, let's really get started. Here is the first one. Marley was dead to begin with is the first line of a very famous story. Miss, Mrs. H.T. Chapin of Lillington, North Carolina, thinks you quiz kids should be able to identify the story and give its author. Claude? It's The Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Good for you, Claude. That's right. Mary McDowell of uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, says that uh, what you children have been reading in the newspapers, your children and your children's children will read in their history books. She wants to know what significance they will attach to the date September 3rd, 1939. Lois? The day the war began. Well, uh, can you give us something definite? Uh, We'd like some names. Well, um... You know, the governments of France and England declared war on uh, Germany on September 3rd at 11 o'clock. That's right. That's what I wanted you to say. That's okay. All right, let's get along to the next one. See, Brewster Lee of West Englewood, New Jersey, went to a hobby show, and he overheard these bits of conversation. He wants you to tell us what hobby each speaker was interested in. Now, here's the first one. A few coats of dope and your nose block will be completed. Van? Well, I'd be in, uh, being interested in model airplanes. He certainly would. <laughs> That's the lingo, all right, isn't it? Yeah, and I the make them myself. Beg pardon, uh, Van? I make them myself. Oh, you do? Well, that's certainly fine to know. And the next one here, that block will look nice swinging on a hinge. Are you mounting it? Joan. Stamp collecting. Stamp collecting is good. <laughs> they were getting along swell here. Now, two out of three on this one. You have seen all sorts of sound effects used here in the studio by our sound effects man, but there are no sound effects men in the jungle. 
Adrian Morgan of Youngstown, Ohio, asks you to explain just how the elephant, the gorilla, and the cricket make themselves heard. The elephant, the gorilla, and the cricket. Gerard? Well, the elephant trumpets through his trunk, and the gorilla has little pulses in his cheeks that blow out and make a booming sound, and then he also beats on his chest, and the cricket rubs his legs against his wings. I've heard a poem, How Merry the Little Cricket Sings, for he rubs his legs against his wings, and only the male cricket does that. <laughs> All right, thanks, Gerard, and thanks for that nice little poem. That was real cute, <laughs> just like a cricket. Matthew Epstein of Brooklyn, New York, warns you to watch your P's and T's on this one. He asks you to spell three words which he thinks are even harder than the tough ones we had last week. And here they are. The first one is Tomain. Van? T-T-O-M-A-I-N-E. That's right. It can also be spelled without the E, so you're still correct. And the next one is Ptolemy. Claude? P-T-O-L-O-M-Y. No, that's wrong, Claude. Van? P-T-O-L-E-M-Y. That's right. And the third one is Tonsorial. John? T-O-N-S-O-R-I-A-L. Very good. Very good. Miss Elizabeth Long of Lansdowne, Pennsylvania, sends in a new kind of spelling question. And she asks me to spell the words on the piano. And all you have to do is tell me the three words that I spell as I strike the different notes. Now, they're all things that we might have for dinner tomorrow. Simple, isn't it? <laughs> Very simple. But I'll bet we don't hear any coaching from the audience. Now, here's the first word. And listen closely. And just a second, I'll be over at the piano. Here's the first word. Egg. Egg is good. <laughs> good for you. All right, here is the second one. Joan? Beef. Beef is good. All right, now watch on this third one here. Cabbage is good. All right for you. <laughs> that was mighty fine. Now, two out of three on this next one. Glenna L. Wells of Parma Heights, Ohio, asked for some things that might be found on the Christmas tree. For example, an act of courtesy. That, of course, would be a bow. Spelled B-O-U-G-H, of course. <laughs> now, what about these? Something also found in the sewing basket. Van? Needles. Needles, you bet. And uh, the next, baggage. <clears throat> Gerard? A trunk. Trunk of the tree is right. And the third, now existing. Gerard? Present. Present is right. <laughs> Thank you. We really took the old Christmas tree right down there. Now, uh, not forgetting what this day is, Mrs. E. A. Schmidt of Oakland, California, wants to know why Dutch children, when expecting St. Nicholas, put their wooden shoes by the fireplace and fill them with hay. Lois? Well, I don't, I don't know about the custom exactly, but I think it's because a wooden shoe could serve as a manger if a baby was placed in it. Of course, it's too small. <laughs> well, that's hardly the answer. Uh, Gerard? Well, it's because the children fill them with hay... Because St. Nicholas is supposed to come on a white horse on the night of December the 5th. And the, on December the 6th is St. Nicholas Day. And they fill them their shoes with hay so that the St. Nicholas's white horse will have something to eat. And St. Nicholas takes out the hay and puts in their presents. Well, Gerard, you've told me everything. (laughs) 
Well, kids, we're off to a good start. And now then you can relax for a moment. It's recess time. Christmas Day is almost done, but Christmas week has just begun. So in between now and New Year, we wish health and joy and cheer. Now, Dad, remember, Junior's train was given to him, not you. And you can't get away with a candy cane as fast as you used to do. Dolls, drums, and horns are for girls and boys. And we oldsters just can't take it. Because a headache comes from too much noise, and it's sometimes hard to shake it. If food is taken in excess and upset stomach rises, take Alka-Seltzer. Ease distress. It soothes pain. Alkalizes. Now, here's a line to end my rhyme. Take heed. Twill pay you well, sir. At Christmas time and all the time, try friendly Alka-Seltzer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to The Quiz Kids, presented by the makers of Alka-Seltzer. Questions are sent in by you listeners. The sender of each question used receives a new Zenith portable radio with patented built-in movable wave magnet. This fine set will operate on its own self-contained batteries or on your electric light circuit and will work perfectly not only in your own home, but out of doors, in your car, in trains, in steel buildings, and under other ordinarily difficult conditions. We reserve the right to reword questions, and if like questions are submitted, the first received will be used. All questions become the property of Quiz Kids. Mail your questions to the Quiz Kids, National Broadcasting Company, Chicago. Quiz Kids, National Broadcasting Company, Chicago. May I remind you, too, that you can have fun playing a new question game, Beat the Quiz Kids, now appearing in many local newspapers. Well, kids, here's the first report from the judges. So far, you haven't missed a single question. And your individual scores are Van, 60 points, Joan, 40, Gerard, 70, Lois, 20, and Claude, 30. And here is the next question. James E. Fraser of Rye, New York, is going to test your knowledge of physics. If, when you get up in the morning, you should open the door which separates your cold bedroom from the warm hall, and you should light a candle and set it on the threshold, which way would the flame point, and why? Van? Well, it would point out towards the warm room, because the cold air would be going in there. Well, uh, can you explain that a little... Well, uh, the hot air, of course, it being lighter for, for the volume than the cold air, would tend to rise. And the, the hot air in the one room would tend to go into the other room up near the ceiling, while the cold air would go into the other room at, near the floor. And therefore, the, uh, the flame would be blown towards the hot room. That's very good, Van. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Now then, Marcella Festa of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, reminds us that next week is New Year's and that we all should be taking inventories of ourselves to see what New Year's resolutions we should make. He wants to know what resolutions you kids think you should include on your list. Uh, Joan? Well, I'd like to read one good book every week. <coughs> well, that's a good resolution. I'm sure you can keep that up. Is there anything else you'd like to put on your list? Well... That's about all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're certainly making it easy for yourself, yes. Joan. <laughs> Claude? Well, I'd like to keep up my good marks in school. Well, I think that is a very good one. Yes, sir, Claude. Uh, let's see now, uh, Van? Well, that's about what I was going to do. I was also going to resolve to see if I could answer more questions on the quiz kids. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best one, yes. <laughs> Lois, how about you? Well, I'm going to improve the bad marks and keep up the good marks. I uh, have to. That's fine. And, uh, Gerard? Tolerance is what I need. Well, <laughs> 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 all right for you sometimes, Gerard, but then sometimes I need it, too. <laughs> 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 well, that's a very good one, Gerard. <laughs> And I wish you a lot of luck. <laughs> now, our next question here, S.J.T. Strauss of Chicago asks, what proverbs might prompt your mother to do these things? Keep you from staying up late, for instance. Lois? Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Very good. And uh, 
What proverb might prompt your mother to uh, uh, keep you from, uh, I mean, uh, ask you to run to her the minute you tear your clothes? Claude? A stitch in time saves nine. It certainly does. And the next one, insist that you spend only part of your weekly allowance on things you like to buy. Uh, Van? A penny saves and a penny earns. That's very good. Now, that was too easy, I'm afraid, kid. Let's see if you can give a couple of more proverbs or quotations about money. Pardon? Penny wise, pound foolish. Very good. Gerard? He who steals my purse steals trash, but he who filters from me my good name enriches himself not, but leaves me poor indeed. That is from William Shakespeare. It certainly is, Gerard, and that's marvelous. <laughs> and then, of course, there's uh, Money Makes the World Go Round, and uh, Money Makes the Mare Go, and Ere You Consult Your Fancy, Consult Your Purse, and oh, just a lot of them. Miss Henrietta Bryson of Salt Lake City, Utah, wants to take you on a vacation trip to three United States dependencies. Now, she describes each dependency as follows, and you are to identify at least two of them. The first is, without a natural supply of fresh water. Without a natural supply of fresh water. And it's a United States dependency. Lois? I think there are Howland Island in the... Uh... Pacific, I don't think, you know, I understand that the Pacific is all around that, and that's salt water, and they can't use it unless they distill it. Well, uh, there's another one that's uh, more familiar to everybody. We'd like to have that one, Lois. Well, I don't know what that is, then. Uh, Gerard? Oh, down the hot desert. Well, yes, yeah, of course, we're talking about islands, uh, um... Uh, United States dependencies. Well, the answer to the first one is the Midway Island. That should be very familiar to you. All right, let's take the next one. The second, no private individual is allowed to own land. Lois? Canal zone. That's very good. <laughs> well, you made up the other one, didn't you? Mm -hmm. And the third one, the third has a coastline that exceeds the length of that of the entire United States. Lois? I think it's Alaska. No, that's wrong. Claude? Could it be the Philippines? That's right. That's correct, Claude. Thanks very much. <coughs> Mrs. Winifred H. Bennett of Portland, Maine, suggests that you kids probably have playmates named Jack, Bob, Harry, and Bill. She wants you to use each of these names in a sentence as a verb. Now, for example, the snipers will harry the enemy. Harry meaning to plunder, annoy, vex. All right, uh, Claude. Well, uh, the two lovers build and cooed. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's a good one, Claude. <laughs> we can't keep the romance angle out, can we? <laughs> All right, jo uh, Joan. Uh, what were the others, Bob? Uh, Bob and... The children uh, Bob for apples. That's good. And uh, now we have Jack left. Gerard? Well... You can jack the car. <laughs> sure can. <laughs> and it's a good thing to have one, too, if it's needed. <laughs> well, that takes care of that one, kid. This next one here, Fred R. Michael of Davenport, Washington, thinks this one should be a pipe for smart kids like you. He asks how many one-inch pipes would be required to carry as much water as one two-inch pipe. Van? Oh, it'd be four before one inch pipes need to carry the same as a two inch pipe under similar circumstances, of course. That's very, very good, Ben. I didn't think any of you kids would get that one. <laughs> Miss Dorothy Siglin of Edgewood, Rhode Island, has squeezed three literary characters into the following three lines, and she thinks you should be able to identify them. Now listen closely. Two out of three on this one. Who raked the meadow sweet with hay? Ben? Mud Muller. On a summer's day. <laughs> That's correct. Maud Muller on a summer's day raked the meadow sweet with hay. Now then, who poorest a full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art? Claude? Well, maybe that could be Eurydice. No. Who poorest a full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art? Well, let's take the next one. Let you think about that one. 
whose eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming? Whose eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming? Now, that should be very familiar to you boys and girls. Well, a second one. Uh, Van, you were going to say... Oh, I might be Frankenstein's monster. (laughs) (laughs) No. The second one would be, uh, 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 who pour us to full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art would be the Skylark uh, in the poem To a Skylark by Shelley. And whose eyes of all the seeming of a demon that is dreaming would be the raven in the poem The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Quote the raven, nevermore, unquote. (laughs) (laughs) Zara Marie Boyer, I had to get that in there, unquote. (laughs) Zara Marie Boyer of Elkhart, Indiana, waxes poetical to ask you this interesting question. You are to identify these Catherines, two out of three. Three Catherines in history have earned much fame. One ruled her country, and her husband, Peter, was his name. The second had reason to fear London's famous tower, while the third served poison potions to pass an idle hour. Van? Well, uh, let me hear the first one again. I'm not sure about it. One ruled her country, and her husband, Peter, was his name. That would be Catherine the Great. That's right. All right, how about the second one? Uh, Claude? Well, uh, the second one would be Catherine, Henry VIII's, uh, one of Henry VIII's wives. That's correct. And what and, was the third one? And the third one? While the third served poison potions to pass an idle hour. Uh, would that be in Macbeth? No. While the third served poison potions to pass an idle hour. Well, you've gotten two out of three, so that's all that's necessary, <coughs> boys and girls. Sorry to interrupt, Joe, but once more, Father Time has caught up with you. Well, thanks, Marvin. Kids, the judges will have the final scores in just a moment. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. <laughs> What is this? Hey, look, kids. There's a belated replica of Santa Claus coming into the studio. But wait a minute. There's something funny here. Come on out from behind those whiskers, Marvin Miller, and let's have an explanation of this Santa Claus business. Well, all right, Joe. Wait till I take them off. (laughs) (laughs) You see, it's this way, Joe. I really feel like Santa today. I've got a free gift for every single person listening. Now, even Santa Claus can't do better than that. And I'm going to tell the folks about it or know the reason why. Well, that's all right, Marvin, and we're mighty glad you did remember all of our listeners. So, fire right ahead. Go it's right ahead. the new 1941 Miles Weather Calendar, a token of appreciation from your friend and ours, your druggist. And there's a free copy waiting for every one of you. Now, I know thousands of you are already familiar with these famous Miles Weather Calendars, for they have been published by the makers of Alka-Seltzer for years. And I know you'll want to get your new 1941 edition. This new 1941 Miles Weather Calendar shows all the holidays and church days. It gives the moon phases and the sunrise and sunset times for each day. It indicates best fishing dates and planting dates for flowers, as well as for farm crops of all kinds, and contains a host of other helpful information. You'll find a great many uses for this new calendar throughout 1941. It is printed in attractive colors, All dates and figures are large enough to be read easily from across the room. And remember, this calendar is free. There's positively nothing to buy. You just go to your druggist and ask him for the new 1941 Miles Weather Calendar. He'll be glad to give it to you. But be sure you get your copy right away. Do it before his supply is exhausted. The new 1941 Miles Weather Calendar. Free from your druggist. judges are finishing checking the report cards, we'll hear a word from Miss Charlotte Carr, director of world-famous Hull House, our guest observer for this evening, Miss Carr. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, and thank you, Quiz Kids. 
for one of the most pleasant half hours I have ever had. With your amazing knowledge and your lovable personalities, you are bringing pleasure and entertainment to thousands, and you're having a perfectly grand time doing it. I sincerely believe that in addition, you are doing all children a real service. You are making adults aware of the truly great things that boys and girls can do if the opportunity is provided them. Every day at Hull House, I work with children. These children and others throughout the nation have potentialities for great and useful lives. Many of them, however, will be lost to the world through economic privation. Quiz kids, it's my hope that in your accomplishments, we adults will see our responsibility to provide to children everywhere the opportunity to develop to the fullest whatever capabilities and talents they may have. Car. Well, kids, the judges have finished their deliberations. You missed only one question tonight, and the individual scores place Van first, Gerard second, and Claude third. So you three, I'll see you back next Wednesday night. You all were excellent students tonight, and I take pleasure in presenting all five of you in behalf of the makers of Alka-Seltzer, these $100 denomination United States savings bonds. We hope you will be able to make good use of them in furthering your education. the names of next week's newcomers, we'll hear a final word from Marvin Miller. Safety pays. This winter, guard against the danger of a deficiency of vitamins A and D. Here's how you and every member of your family can do it, and for only a penny a day per person. Take one a day brand vitamin A and D tablets every day. That's the name. One a day tablets. One tablet a day is all you need. One tablet a day is all you take. And one penny a day is all it costs. Young and old alike, babies, growing children, older folks, all need vitamins A and D. Each one-a-day tablet contains the same amount of vitamins A and D contained in two whole teaspoonfuls of cod liver oil, meeting minimum United States pharmacopoeia standards. One-a-day tablets are pleasant tasting, no fishy, oily taste, and no aftertaste. Help yourself and your family to these two important vitamins this winter. Just listen to these low prices. 30 tablets, 35 cents. 90 tablets, only 85 cents. And 180 tablets, just $1.50. One-a-day vitamin A and D tablets have been developed and are guaranteed by the makers of Alka-Seltzer, tested and approved by Good Housekeeping Bureau and commended by Consumer Service Bureau of Parents Magazine. Ask your druggist for one-a-day tablets. Look for the big one on the package. Thank you, Marvin. Friends, next week our newcomers will be Sheila Brenner, age 14, of Chicago, Illinois, and Pat Chandler, age 14, of River Forest, Illinois. This is Joe Kelly dismissing the Quiz Kids class until next Wednesday, New Year's Day, at the same time. Good night, kids, and a happy New Year to you. Good night, Mr. Kelly. Good night, Mr. Kelly. The same to you. Listen again next Wednesday night to the Quiz Kids. The makers of Alka-Seltzer present three programs each week, all of them on NBC Network. On Friday night, Alec Templeton time. On Saturday night, the famous Alka-Seltzer National Barn Band. And next Wednesday night again, the Quiz Kids. For interesting variety and entertainment, listen to the Alka-Seltzer shows. Marvin Miller speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company.